Hi, I'm Matt, and apparently the events of the hit Netflix sci-fi comedy musical Stranger Things are inspired by true events. Let's talk about it. Since I was a child, I've been naturally inquisitive, questioning anything and everything that didn't quite make sense. As I grew, I poured countless hours into a number of conspiracy theories. Some of these theories I believe, and some of these theories I don't. But some of them I do. Here I'll be studying the evidence for and against all of history's mysteries. Doing the work so you don't have to. But you really should do it on your own, like check sources and all that. Okay. On today's episode, The Montauk Project. Unless you've been under a freaking rock, you'd at least be aware of the smash freaking hit show Stranger Things on Netflix. The show, set in the 80s, follows a group of nerds and their pretty much solo efforts to stop US and Russian covert experiments from ripping a hole between this dimension and one full of goopy alien dogs. It's spoopy, it's fun, and it's absolute fiction. Psych. Let's talk about Camp Hero. So Camp Hero, located in Montauk, New York, is a now decommissioned military base that dates back as far as the Revolutionary War. It was used in various training purposes throughout the War of 1812, the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II. It began being used as a coastal defense installation disguised as a small fishing village to conceal their vast artillery. By the 1950s, control of the base was largely transferred to the Air Force, and by the 1960s, a radar system was installed, along with a humongous 70-ton, 120-foot wide antenna, which was at the time considered the most advanced surveillance radar available. The base closed in 1982 and by 1984 all 468 acres had been transferred to government agencies, most of which is now managed by the offices of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Sounds super normal. And to the rest of the world it kind of was until 1982 when Preston B. Nichols and Peter Moon released the book The Montauk Project experiments in time. Before I go that far into this episode, I want to make it clear that the wonderful people on the research team and legal department are incredibly upset with me as nearly nothing that Preston Nichols, Al Bielik, or Duncan Cameron say has any credible evidence to support them. And the books that the conspiracy theories have been born from have been regularly categorized as fiction. So, you know, with that, let's do it. This thing is hairy as hell, so let me just do some board time. I've loosened it. Oh my God. Oh. Jesus. We're all good, baby. <laughs> so, let's start with a timeline. We're gonna say it ends in 1992. This is the book. In the book, Nichols, who claims that he's an electrical engineer with a specialty in electromagnetic phenomena, states that in the 1970s, he began researching mental telepathy. His goal was to debunk it, but in 1974, while working with numerous psychics, he found that every day at the same time, all of the psychics would be jammed for approximately 20 minutes. He assumed that the problem was an electronic signal. After searching for the signal, he found that the signal could be traced to the radar antenna at the Air Force Base at Montauk Point. We didn't have an antenna or a Preston Nichols action figure, so these will have to do. Finally, in 1984, Nichols claims that he visited the abandoned base, which he implies had been deserted in a slightly suspicious manner. There he finds a large amount of deserted machinery. Also in the building, Nichols claims that he met a man who appeared to be homeless. Nichols states that the man recognized him and even, more strangely, said that Nichols had been his boss on the project. It's getting weird. Now let's fast forward to November of 1984 when a dude named Duncan Cameron arrives at Nichols' lab. Duncan has a piece of equipment and wants to ask Nichols about it. Nichols takes Duncan to the Montauk base and he recognizes it too. According to Nichols, not only did he recognize it, he knew the purpose of each building. Who's this Duncan you're no doubt wondering? Well, hold on to your wig because I'm about to blow it off. Once again, the research team and legal department would like me to remind you all that this is all based on literally just his testimony and no verified sources. We're going to start with 1943 and the Philadelphia Experiment. In 1943, the U.S. government was researching radar invisibility in what they called the Rainbow Project. The U.S. government was allegedly experimenting with creating an electromagnetic bottle around the USS Eldridge, a Navy destroyer escort ship. For the purposes of this, this is the Eldridge. Because we didn't have a better... Uh, Thing. and the, the, we don't have any money. The whole purpose of the experiment was to make the Eldridge invisible to enemy radar. The book states that not only did the ship become invisible to radar, it became invisible to the naked eye and removed it from the space-time continuum with the ship suddenly appearing in Norfolk, Virginia, hundreds of miles away before 
reappearing in Philadelphia. With this, the crew found themselves in complete disorientation, obvi. Nichols asserts that the crew was then discharged as mentally unfit after considerable time in rehabilitation. Now we've officially reached the point where, to believe this, you're having to suspend belief slightly or majorly depending on who you are. As Nichols and Duncan work together more and more to try and recover Duncan's memory from its programming, Duncan tells Nichols more and more about what went on at the base, what we call the Montauk Project. And according to Nichols, they're both rapidly jogging each other's memories. Think of Dude Where's My Car. What's your memories? Whoa! Oh, what's your memories? Sweet! Does anyone get that reference? So Preston Nichols is also recovering all of these repressed memories of working at the base, at which point he becomes certain he was involved. And then Duncan reveals that he and his brother were on the Philadelphia experiment. Hang on, I know this doesn't make any sense to you at all. You know that part in like every Spider-Man movie where Peter Parker is desperately trying to hold two things together at once while they're rapidly falling apart? That's kind of me reading this story. So supposedly, according to Bielik.com, the self-published website from Al Bielik, the supposedly reincarnated brother of Duncan Cameron, Ed Cameron and Duncan Cameron were both aboard the Eldridge when it blipped. Somehow in the process, these dudes yeeted themselves off the ship and zipped away out of time. All right, I'm gonna come back to this, so just hang on. Let's talk about what Nichols says the Montauk Project was all about. According to Nichols, in the early 1970s, the Montauk Air Force Base was reestablished and they were kicking off all these wacky experiments. I'm gonna paraphrase the book, but Nichols claims that they did a bunch of stuff at this base. They experimented with weather control, mood control, definitely psychic powers, mind control, and time travel. Remember how I hooked you in with the whole Stranger Things angle? Well, here's where it pays off. So according to the book, many of these experiments revolve around a psychic, Duncan Cameron. And they hooked him up to all these machines, all these transmitters or whatever. The book explains it and it kind of has diagrams. Maybe I'm too dumb to understand or maybe the book was just intentionally confusing, who cares? Anyway, they hook him up to all these machines and what he could think about, they could see on a screen. They take this further and by late 1977 claim that what he could think up, he could actually materialize. According to the book, many times it would only be visible and not solid to the touch, like a ghost. Sometimes it was a real solid object that would remain as long as the transmitter was on. One of the experiments, which Nichols claims they called the seeing eye, Duncan could allegedly concentrate on a person and be able to see as if he were seeing through their eyes, hearing through their ears, and feeling through their body. Anywhere on the planet. Where have you seen that before? Maybe a show on Netflix? And I'm not talking about Queer Eye. Then, in 1979, they ran into a problem where Duncan's materializations were happening out of time. He would think of something at 8 p.m., and it wouldn't show up until midnight or 6 a.m. It appeared that their experiments were possibly bending time, and so they began focusing on bending time. Okay, then we flash forward to 1981. They continually pursue experiments in time bending and time travel. They somehow come across this idea of a time vortex, which has anchor points at every 20 years. And 1983. They decide that they have a master vortex going from August 12, 1943, the alleged date of the Philadelphia experiment, to approximately August 12th, 1983. Now, in the book, they say they do all these experiments in time travel from 1981 to 1983. They're making missions to Mars, they're programming random kids that they basically kidnap, sending raw recruits to 6037 AD. I know this sounds insane, it's in the book. I didn't write it. What I wanna talk about is what Nichols asserts happens on August 12th, 1983. This is the stranger thingiest of events. According to Nichols, they're running the transmitter and have been continuously for about a week, when all of a sudden, the freaking USS Eldridge appears through the time portal. Remember that guy? Apparently, when the two jumped off the ship, they popped up here in 1983. How neat. Thinking quickly, Nichols said that the researchers managed to keep 1980s Duncan away from 1940s Duncan to, you know, not giantly goof up everything in the space-time continuum. But what did happen, 1980s Duncan starts thinking about some big hairy monster and it materializes. I swear to God this is all in the book, which this man claims is the truth. Anyway, the monster's going nuts, wrecking everything, so Nichols and his team are ordered to shut down the generators and the monster disappears. They send Duncan and his brother back to 1943 to destroy the equipment on the Eldridge and lock it all up. Closing the base, wiping everyone's memories, and letting out a big ol' oopsie. It's also worth pointing out how just convenient it is, is that these space traveler dudes went back to destroy the evidence. 
That's a side note for me. Now, nearly all of that was recovered, allegedly, from the repressed memories of Duncan Cameron, his brother, and Preston Nichols. So, is this all just a bunch of baloney? In the book's foreword, Peter Moon writes, Some of the data you will read in this book can be considered soft facts. He says soft facts are not untrue, they are just not backed up by irrefutable documentation. So, I mean, what do you do with that? Are these guys just full of it? In an article by the Huffington Post, Christopher Gratano, who directed a film called The Montauk Chronicles, talks of the base. Above ground, there are also huge doors, or bunkers, cemented and sealed into the sides of several hills and forest area. He adds, some people claim that these are entrances to underground tunnel systems that ran beneath the military base that would supposedly bring you to the actual entrance of the facility. Though I don't know who these some people are. In the same article, president of the Montauk Chamber of Commerce, Paul Monty, mentions, there are a lot of good stories about that area there. When I came out here in the 1960s, the Air Force still had an active base. So most of the kids I went to grade school with were kids from the base. He goes on to say, I remember stories about time travel and secret underground experiments and aliens. Through the years, we've seen lots of characters in Montauk, and we've often used that explanation to explain their existence. I mean, it's not like the US government doesn't have a documented history of doing kind of shitty tests on its people. From 1932 to 1972, the Public Health Service conducted a study titled Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, which participants were misled and not given treatment even though it existed. Beginning in 1953, the CIA conducted conducted its MK Ultra experiments, drug testing on thousands of Americans without their consent to study mind control, including administering LSD to unknown participants. The MK Ultra program resulted in at least two accidental deaths and countless others who saw harmful residual effects. I'm just saying, while this does seem absolutely bonkers, some of this doesn't make any sense at all. We kind of have it in us to do this. And Netflix is having fun with it, right? So waffle it up or whatever they say on the show. On this one in particular, I'm very interested to know what you guys guys think, so please let me know in the comments. It cannot possibly be stranger than any of the shit I read on the daily.